Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. Most hedge funds generate alpha by exposing themselves to tail risk. So effectively, the more tail risk you expose yourself to, the more alpha you have, the higher your sharp ratio. And in the context of a, of a bull market, that's not a problem. But when you take the whole uh, you know, equity market cycle into account, you see that you pay very, very dearly for that negative skew once every three years, five years, ten years once central banks are less active in the market. So uh, we took the approach that uh, effectively, because of what central banks are doing, volatility is uh, very cheap and people are selling it almost at any price uh, in order to achieve an alpha, which investors then perceive to be skill-based. So it's it's basically, uh, we thought that that approach seemed to be working very well. I don't think it's a long-term stable approach. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm um, excited to have the founder and CIO of one of my favorite managed futures firms with us today. We've got Nigel Kalajan joining us, founder and CIO of Quest Partners, uh, which is the $1 billion plus systematic trading shop that's been posting returns since 1999 or so and seemingly playing chess while the rest of us play checkers the past 20 years. So welcome, Nigel. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see you. How'd I do on the last name? It's okay. Uh, I'm learning at the same time as you. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and where are you? You're in Manhattan. Yep, currently in Manhattan. Uh, survived COVID in Manhattan, so not so bad. Yeah, Upper East Side. What's it been like? Has it been tough this whole COVID time, or it's been uh, not at, not at all? I have to say, it's like uh, I haven't kind of like plugged into the the mass uh, media frenzy around it, so. It's been relatively pleasant and quieter than usual, I have to say, quite pleasant. Right. You think uh, be, you think the rumors New York's dead and it won't come back or will it bounce back eventually? Uh, let's say New York feels like it's coming back because traffic is back, especially last two weeks. And I think they're opening the restaurants even more uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the, there's a you know, serious supply uh, of uh, office space. Obviously, most people are not coming back to the office uh, very soon. And that's going to... Uh, take some time to, to 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 handle that, but otherwise, yeah. Uh, I, I, otherwise, like the everyday action is back, but I would say the, the real estate market and the people coming back to the office is going to take some while. Uh, technology has won on this one, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, and then people yeah. are like, oh, they'll just convert that all to residential. But is that even right? Can you have that many residential units? Uh, you know, it's a balance that's uh, it's happened in the past. People have moved out of the cities and come back, depending on you know manufacturing and uh, different cycles of the economy. Uh, on this one, I'm going to say technology has won, and it's a it's a big win. Uh, I think it's going to be hard to convince people to come back uh, in, a, in a crowded city, uh, uh, real estate at a hundred dollars per square foot plus per year, and that type of thing. It's, you know, it's going to take a yeah. while. How about you guys on a firm level? You plans to leave the city or you'll just get a little cheaper spot or? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, uh, we're always considering uh, all options, but I would say not, nothing apparent right now. I mean, I spend uh, a lot of time upstate New York in uh, Woodstock. Uh, I like being in nature and getting away from uh, uh, the mindset of the city. But yep. uh, as a firm, I think we'll, uh, we'll maintain the, you know, obviously the, the headquarters here. And, you know, some people are, you know, people are taking chances and getting further away from the office, but that's fine. That's fine for us. Everything's functioning totally fine. Love it. Uh, so give us a little background. Where'd you grow up? How'd you get into this hedge fund space and being a quant and all that good stuff? Um, I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, believe it or not. Uh, uh, obviously, war zone when I, when I was growing up, so it was quite, uh, quite a scary place. Uh, 
uh, I was born of Armenian uh, parents, basically Armenian descent. So somehow in my background, there's uh, uh, kind of like the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and all that was like uh, uh, always there. Uh, came uh, came to New York for uh, initially to finish high school, but uh, went to college instead, completely by chance. Uh, Notre Dame Electrical Engineering, uh, then I worked for Anderson Consulting for four years, Columbia Business School, and then uh, out of business school, I was ready to start a CTA basically in 1994. Uh, couldn't get the capital to start the CTA, so I did a couple of uh, side jobs, uh, like trading for a risk arc fund and uh, also running a fund of fund for a couple of years. And then finally in 1999, uh, I had enough interest to start the CTA uh, and I did. So electrical engineer that's interesting right a lot of these i feel a lot of quants that before there were quant programs were kind of engineers or the engineering mindset for sure um and notre dame i didn't know that did you know salem abraham did not i think he was there at the same time as me yeah and then you both kind of said hey we're gonna go be a cta it's interesting and then yeah. how do you go from just business school to i want to be a cta something piqued your interest there well, uh, I saw that there were so many smart, uh, smart people around and uh, <laughs> I had to find a niche where I could compete, uh, something which was technical enough uh, uh, and required like very focused thoughts in a certain way, but at the same time, uh, not very necessarily, not very plugged into the world as much, kind of like a, um, a very specialist type of thinking. Uh, I thought that worked well for me. Um, so I decided to focus, uh, focus on it, and basically uh, I taught myself how to be a CTA, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but were you I didn't have any mentors or anything like that? But were you reading books, or like how did you first feel like say, oh, these futures markets look interesting, versus like I should start to pick companies or pick stocks or things like that? I mean, I, I used to read Investors Business Daily, and uh, that was very entertaining <laughs> because they, they they give you all these tools to pick stocks and. Uh, to evaluate the strength of the stock market and all that. So at the time, uh, this is, I'm talking 1991, uh, I'm 24 years old and I'm, uh, I bought TradeStation and started testing a lot of these uh, indicators that Investors Business Daily was publishing. And effectively nothing really stuck, Yeah. right? So I was like, my God, you know, all this data, all these things and everybody's following all these indicators, but really uh, it seems like nobody's actually tested these things because they don't seem to provide value beyond, beyond the basic momentum effectively, right? Uh, so that didn't work. And then uh, the, the benefit I saw in futures was the liquidity. You could actually trade very short term with no transaction costs. Uh, and you were able to do a lot, a lot more things that you could do in, that, than you could do in the stock universe, where effectively you're limited in the time frames that you were trading. You had to focus on longer time frames because of the transaction costs. Uh, so moved into futures testing, uh, which at the time, uh, it was quite easy to get daily data on futures. And uh, it was definitely plenty to get going. Yeah. Uh, you Things have evolved a little bit since, but uh... <laughs> do you think uh, investors business daily should change their tagline to "This is quite entertaining"? <laughs> I don't think that's the angle they're going for. Uh, you know I what? Um, yes, I mean that most of Wall Street is really a sales organization. It's not here to provide particular value. Uh, I think it's here to sell investments to the public. Uh, it's a conduit. It's not here to. Uh, uh, necessarily uh, whatever is easy to sell is going to pass through uh, that structure and uh, not necessarily what's best for investors. Yeah. I've, uh, I've so written that in investors a, business daily is doing a good job at that. So. Yeah. I've written that in a paper before our blog post of uh, instead of the military industrial complex taking over, we had the financial industrial complex <laughs> taking over. That's just there for the relentless bid, right? They're always going to be pushing and that's, that's what they get paid for. So uh, they don't get paid for performance typically. Uh, and so I'd never known you were a, a domer too. Usually that's the old joke. How do you know someone went to Notre Dame? They'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done a good job of not telling me that over the years. Yeah, um, yeah. it's secrets. And so tell. And so what it's. And then Quest started in 99 or was a little... In, in 2001, 99, yeah. I, I started a firm called Enterprise with a partner. And in 2001, we split and uh, I started Quest at the, uh, in 2001. Got it. And then, um, right, the, the previous firm, you had a lot of money from MF Global or not MF Global, but MAN. Uh, MAN was at Quest. So uh, MAN invested Quest, in sorry. 2003 yeah. until 2010. Correct. The fund of fund of... Uh, 
Man. And so yeah. that was from your previous work and had made connections and they believed in what you were doing and say, hey, we'll, we'll see this essentially? Well, uh, we cleared through them and uh, somehow uh, uh, our broker, you know, passed our information over to the allocation team. Uh, we connected and uh, things made sense and um, they started with a small allocation that grew to over 500 million uh, over the years and they took 90% uh, capacity rights at the time and uh, so for a while, we didn't have to uh, basically uh, have any outward facing efforts in terms of uh, communicating with investors or anything like that. It simplified our lives substantially. Uh, it, was, it, was good, uh, it was a good cycle. Uh, we had a, a very successful relationship, uh, very profitable for everyone. Yeah, it's almost like if you could draw it up in a lab, that's how you would do it, right? Of like, let us focus on our models and our building the pipes. Yeah, a few years before we have to get into uh, right, like investor facing, raising money, all that stuff. Yeah, uh, although I have to say I uh, really enjoy my investors today. I, I think that uh, over time, uh, you know, I think that the the tendency for uh, for um, for a startup hedge fund is to try to please investors, uh, you know, at, at any cost. Uh, for us, because we had the chance to kind of like define ourselves. Uh, without having to do that, to, we have a much more, I would say, defined character, uh, which is not the uh, kind of uh, average hedge fund type. Uh, and because our, char our character is so defined, we also have a different message and we're attracting people who believe in our message. And uh, the interaction with the investors is actually very important in helping me, uh, I would say, first, uh, help me understand markets and uh, get a perspective that I wouldn't get from people working within the firm, typically, right? So it's a... Uh, uh, the interaction with investors today is something I, I value tremendously and what, as a two-week information exchange. Yeah. And I feel like it might have helped that you were a bit of an outsider, right? And then kind of brought these outside views to the, the space instead of towing the normal hedge fund line, so to speak. Uh, absolutely. Like uh, growing up in a, coming from a different background, uh, ex experiencing different types of risks uh, made me look at the world very differently than a typical a uh, guy who grew up on the upper side in New York and uh, jumped into finance and had family in finance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I was very, I felt very comfortable uh, being outside of the herd. Yeah, it reminds uh, me of uh, Rodrigo Gordillo at uh, Resolve Asset Management. He grew up in Chile and they basically confiscated all the assets and his family's, all his money got. And he's like, this is a risk that no one else thinks about in this world, but it's a risk. Um, and so what, what's it like once you went over a billion, was that a big milestone for the firm, for you, right? Like, it's crazy to sit there and think like, I mean, you know, is it a huge responsibility? I manage a billion dollars plus of other people's money. Um, you know, what, what's that like? Give, give the listeners you know, a little taste of what that's like. Uh, I'm going to say I live in a different reality than most people where I don't look at the score very often. Uh, so I don't know what's happening on the outside, whether like how much, money, how much money we're managing or our returns. I'm very focused on uh, doing the right thing every day on, at a micro level, being extremely attentive to detail, almost uh, paranoid. You know, growing up in the war, you're very, very sensitive to certain risks. Uh, you have to have, like, you know, watching out with a completely very different level of attention than most people. And for me, it's my everyday, the quality of my actions, the quality of my mindset that I'm focused on. Uh, everything else is downstream from there. So, of course, uh, when you grow, uh, the complexity of every decision is uh, exponentially uh, larger and you have to uh, develop models and systems to handle every decision because you cannot be making all the decisions that are like, you know, far reaching in, in every corner of the firm. So the complexity got much worse, but uh, I wouldn't say it felt different to me. Uh, my focus has remained the same. I mean, uh, it's very uh, internally focused, focused more on myself, uh, being very sensitive to what I see and perceive myself, not being uh, affected by what's going on out there. And as uh, things are thrown to us, we just have to handle them one by one. And uh, with a clear mindset, I, I don't see a billion, 10 billion or whatever it is uh, as, uh, as being the obstacle, right? Today we're at 1.8, but... It helps but, being systematic too, right? Because you were doing 30 crude oil contracts 15 years ago. Now you may be doing 300, but it's just, right? It's just a number. It's just systematically going into the market. Yeah, we're, we're often like 1% uh, of the volume on, uh, you know, gold, crude, even uh, US bonds, bonds. So we're, 
We're actually quite large for a small firm or so, you know, for a small firm like us. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, those are, uh, nothing happened. Uh, it was not like a, a big step up. It was a slow, yeah. gradual increase. So we had the chance to adapt and learn. And uh, of course, it's uh, really important to uh, have, maintain a beginner's mind and realize that uh, you're going to grow to the place where you really don't, I've never done this before type of thing. And I'm always learning. And I, there's always uh, great role models out there. So I've always looked up to, you know, the people who uh, did did well in our industry, and even though I wasn't connected to them, I you know read what they wrote, uh, listened to their interviews, uh, try to put myself in their shoes and and uh, understand what they knew, what they did right, and what they didn't do right, and, and that type of thing. So if you keep an open mindset, I would say that the growth is uh, is there to be had. Uh, it becomes problematic if you're afraid, if you think that you're trying to make yourself right, you want your ideas to be right, you want. Uh, you want confirmation from people around you that the, the way you're thinking, the way you're doing things is the right way of doing things, then, it, then growth becomes very, very difficult. Uh, then reality and, <laughs> and you start clashing quite dramatically. Uh, the like, softer you are, you know, uh, the easier it is to, to grow. Right. Sounds like they're not going to uh, model a character after you on, on the Billion show anytime soon, right? Uh, <laughs> they want the guy who's like, yeah, I hit a billion and I'm on at the Kentucky Derby and... Uh, you know, on my jet and, and showing up. Let's talk, you've mentioned the word mindset a few times. Uh, you're part of a few foundations that focus on meditation and mindset. Tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing there personally and how it ties back to the firm. Yeah, well, you know, like I, I grew up, I didn't, uh, if you look at me as a kid, I was like a shy guy. Uh, average grades, uh, not confident. I was like very, uh, you wouldn't have seen any signs of uh, success uh, in my future, right? You say, okay, you know, nice guy, but nothing special. Um, you know, when I came to New York and, uh, you know, my, my, di- my, my dad died at a relatively young age for me. I mean, uh, and I had to take care of, uh, you know, my family and, uh, and that type of thing. Uh, I said, you know what, I'm here, I'm working hard. Let me try to make something out of this. And I looked around and I said, what are ways where I can take, you can take somebody who's general, you know, relatively average like me and turn him into something. Uh, the, the th- and I tried many different uh, uh, ways of improving myself. And uh, I felt the, the techniques, the philosophies, the practices within the realm of meditation were the most useful in that regard. Uh, first, they, um, they helped me handle stress much better. Uh, they helped me maintain a, an independent uh, mindset. Uh, very present moment, very realistic, um, not philosophical or idealistic in any way. Uh, so I, it made me very, very sensitive to my environment and things. Uh, also, the creativity that came with, with meditation was quite, quite tremendous. I was able to think things that were not taught to me. So it wasn't a question of repeating what was given to me. And it, it literally, uh, you know, I would say uh, into a lot of decisions were made out of intuition, out of nowhere. Uh, so very early on in my life, uh, I started the daily meditation practice in the morning and, you know, you get up at like four or five in the morning and uh, you're doing an hour, an hour, an hour and a half of practices and uh, meditation and some other things to, to affect, uh, affect the mind. And out of nowhere, you have all these ideas that relate to what you really need to do uh, come up. Uh, I feel very, like most, very early age was we're talking like in your twenties or in your early twenties, early twenties. Um, so uh, so it wasn't a question of like intellectually understanding things. Uh, I would get these ideas literally as hunches. And uh, it came at times where I wasn't trying to think or I definitely was uh, the priming of my mind was not based on what I knew. Okay. It was in a kind of like a, in, a, in a world where I, like, I know nothing. I'm just observing my mind. And as I, I can observe my mind or somebody else's mind or et cetera, it was a like very, very neutral uh, observation and a uh, very neutral space uh, you're in. Uh, and in the morning, I typically got all of my best ideas. And the, the work day was really a question of implementing what came up to me in the morning, right? So once I'm in the office, effectively, I'm going to say I'm not really thinking. I'm uh, it, kind of grounding and expressing and implementing things that came to me in the morning. So very, very different uh, than, hey, you know, uh, so I didn't have like a, 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 you know, a strong support structure or mentors and things like that to actually guide me. Uh, the guidance really came in the morning in my, in my early hour, you know, in the early hours of the day during my meditation. And that's, so, 
that's fascinating me of like you'd think where do those ideas come from right like if they're they're coming from somewhere i think mm -hmm. it was i'm trying to remember my philosophy days of Immanuel kant or something he said all these ideas are in the ether and you kind of just go your brain can go up and grab them but to me like the physical wetware in there needs to have that it's in there somewhere and maybe meditation just opens the pathway to to grab that kernel that's been built in the back of your mind I mean, uh, the, the thing is not to look at the world through your own beliefs or through your own ideas or through your own calculations, because all of these are very limited. Uh, they're actually randomly put in you based on your, uh, on your experiences. Uh, and the way your mind calculates is typically based on your value system more than on the accuracy of what you're actually doing. So to really understand how your mind is going to think, uh, your mind is going to try to basically justify your like your value system and your beliefs. It's going to see what it wants to see rather than what is really out there. Uh, so really meditation is a question of saying, you know what, let me just observe and be uh, the, the most uh, passive as I can be, the most receptive I can be rather than uh, trying to project and make myself right and enforce my ideas on the world around me. Um, and then tying so it back to... Uh trading like that's especially dangerous right if your worldview gets based on your position of you know i'm thinking bill ackman with valiant or something like i have such a large position i have to believe that this is going to work out uh that's a different system of trading it's called like you know negative skew and uh, negative yeah, yeah, convexity yeah. and tail risk and all that uh there's a place uh, there's a place for that in today's world and uh it's working quite well i mean some of what it doesn't work is quite a big splash uh but uh <laughs> Uh, yes, it's, it's um, uh, you know, over the years, so still talking about meditation, I practiced Zen meditation, I did a lot of like silent retreats and stuff, it was always beginner's mind, beginner's mind, like, uh, if, so, if you face an obstacle, it's not a question of going and like hitting it and trying to like uh, punch through it, it's a question, my teacher always used to say, sit more, just sit and meditate more, forget about the obstacle, just sit and meditate more, so um, Looping back to uh, where we got to this, so uh, the foundation that I started uh, to promote meditation and yoga and some of the, you know, uh, some of the healing sciences around it, because these sciences helped me so much, I wanted to, I always felt that wherever I went, I was talking about these things, whether it's at work or in a, in a social context, eventually I said, let me have kind of a foundation that promotes these things uh, naturally, and that, that's how these things came about. Uh, I also work with the David Lynch Foundation on uh, promoting TM, which I think is uh, in the context of uh, somebody who is living in New York, etc. I would say it's the best, you know, the best and easiest uh, way to meditate uh, without having to spend years and years learning stuff. And give us a quick d down and dirty on TM. Uh, I wish I, uh, I had bumped into it earlier in my life, let's put it that way. But it's basically a technique where twice a day you're uh, meditating for uh, 20 minutes uh, with a couple of minutes of uh, just sitting still, uh, once in the morning and uh, once in the afternoon. And you're typically uh, effectively very, uh, in a subtle way, repeating a certain sound mentally uh, in your head. And um, effectively, it's a way of relaxing your body uh, effectively, to hear that sound, you need to let go of uh, your physical holding on and your uh, emotional holding on and your intellectual holding on. Uh, and as your uh, sensitivity becomes more and more subtle, you enter a very, very peaceful state, uh, which is uh, very, uh, I'll say, easy to recover in and get a new perspective on things. Uh, and this is an actual sound being played in the room or something? Or it's, no, you're it's something finding a... An internal noise. Yeah. You're actually uh, thinking a sound, but in a very subtle way. Just a, a, you're not like forcing the sound. You're just allowing the sound, the sound to be there. Eventually, it's kind of an automatic thing that you hear, and sometimes it starts relating to certain uh, internal body sounds, you know, such as the heartbeat or the breath or whatever. But not necessary. And uh, when you uh, effectively you're uh, trying to uh, be sensitive to something very subtle and very quiet within yourself, and uh, your whole all of your uh, uh, kind of active systems in the body let go and uh, it, I found it to be very useful and you know I've been to India 17 times <laughs> spent yeah. weeks and weeks uh, uh, doing all kind of things torturing myself learning different uh, things um, and I thought that TM was really excellent in a very very short period of time and something you can pick up and uh, be quite uh, get an advanced effect uh, without uh, much effort my cool. wife's uh, 
cousin's husband does this like three day meditation where I don't think they eat or they sit there. Um, that, that seems extreme. Have you done something like that? Uh, yeah, I've done the 10 day version of that. 10 days. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, very, very important experiences for me. Like again, every time I face an obstacle, let's say like my, my, my father got sick and eventually he died or, uh, we were lo- like, we were losing man as a client or whatever was going on. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. And I didn't have, again, resources, whether it's, fi- you know, financial or anything. So it was always, let me go and spend and do a silent retreat or something. And then when you're there, you're effectively looking at the world from a completely different perspective. And you have like this internal strength where you know there's a leap that you can make. And uh, then over time, uh, you, if you hold that mindset, then uh, more and more ideas, more and more concrete steps come along the way to show you how to get there. But you get this like deep conviction that you can go from here to there. Although I don't know the steps they're going to show up just because I have the energy to get there. So if you get that, that type of, uh, um, uh, that type of energy and uh, it's always worked and it's worked yeah. for, it seems for thousands of years. And continues the amazing to- part to me is you come <laughs> back to the hedge fund rat race, so to speak, right? Like a lot of people go into that meditation, do that and come out and say like, I'm, I want to sail the world or I should be doing something different with my life. Um, but that's the amazing part that you're segmenting it and saying, you know, and bringing it to the firm and making sure it's not a place where your soul is getting crushed or whatnot. Yeah. I mean, it's very easy for, uh, if you're a meditator to go into uh, these like new age ideas of manifestation and the world is this and positivity and all that. Uh, for me, it was always a question of balance. Uh, how can you take uh, the energy and the, the perspective and the subtleness of meditation and apply it into the real world to see whether it works or not? It was not a question of uh, you living in a dream or uh, ideally. Yeah. Or, it was really a question of seeing the world like it is and being uh, extremely effective in the world. And going back to how we started, you know, here I am, an average guy who grew up in a, you know, uh, in a war zone uh, with, you know, being exposed to some very traumatic events comes to New York, very competitive place, and in an industry where I know nothing, I'm able to function with very, very little outside help uh, based on these techniques. So it's you know, quite a many, for me, it was a very, very meaningful uh, uh, thing that uh, came into my life. I love it. Um, all right, if we have any listeners left after that, let's get to the, uh, <laughs> let's get to the program. And then, but I will say one thing, I've talked to a few guys at your firm, so you're starting to have the whole firm do it a little bit too, right? It's an option for people. So uh, I, I don't want to impose it on people, but uh, as people face obstacles and say, hey, you know, try this uh, and try reading that book and try, or try taking that course. It works, it works. It doesn't, doesn't. So, you know, All I right. think it stops some people other than me. Yeah. I'm going to try it after this. Not right <laughs> after this, but some, sometime soon. So switching gears, give us the... Uh, you guys have a few programs, um, but give us the 30,000 foot overview, the elevator pitch on the, on the main program, the AlphaQuest original. Yeah, so, so the idea in the AlphaQuest original is to generate returns. Uh, most hedge funds generate alpha by exposing themselves to tail risk. So effectively, the more tail risk you expose yourself to, the more alpha you have, the higher your sharp ratio. And in the context of a, of a bull market, that's not a problem. But when you take the whole uh, you know, equity market cycle into account, you see that you pay very, very dearly for that negative skew once every three years, five years, 10 years, once central banks are less active in the market. So uh, we took the approach that uh, effectively, because of what central banks are doing, volatility is uh, very cheap and people are selling it almost at any price. Uh, in order to achieve an alpha, which investors then perceive to be skill-based. Uh, so it was a, it's a, basically, uh, we thought that, appro- that approach seemed to be working very well. I don't think it's a long-term stable approach, uh, but since the volatility was very cheap, so we started saying, hey, let's trade uh, futures uh, at moments when the volatility was uh, you know, compressed as a, re- as a byproduct of pe- people selling convexity or selling gamma or buying the dips or uh, buying illiquid investments uh, and distorting prices. So we're effectively looking for cheap volatility and what we've um, managed to achieve is returns which are you know, very strong, like do- double, g- double digit returns while being long skew, which is very, very rare in the hedge fund world. 
Yeah. And but which came first? So you started looking at futures, the original program, was it more of a, hey, I want to do trend following because it fits with my personality or whatnot? Or was it deliberately like I'm, I want this positive skew back in the beginning? Well, I didn't know what skew was when I started. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, actually, before trend following, trend following was always there. But I would say trend following uh, entered much more uh, uh, in the mid 2000s after the turtle systems became public and all that for me what the way i started is i bought uh, from uh, uh, i saw a little ad in investors business daily i think it was like five dollars uh, little booklet which was maybe like five pages uh, called uh, opening range volatility breakouts yeah uh, it's literally and it, it spoke about basically uh, trading you know the open of today plus a multiple of volatility you go long, uh, opening of today minus a certain multiple of volatility, you go short, and you exit a day or two days or three days later. And you do it in particular when the vol is compressed. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the idea I had started with. And then uh, trend following was obviously super easy. You can do it with, you know, uh, whether it's price momentum, channel breakouts, or moving averages. Uh, so then we diversified into trend following. And then it was a combination. Then over time, uh, it became harder and harder to trade short term and transaction costs became more significant. So then we became uh, more and more uh, adept at uh, filtering trades uh, in, in, a, uh, in a way that's stable, right? But you, you definitely are to this day are more of a shorter term, right? Than a lot of the peers of like yeah. CTA index or something. I would say you're on the shorter term scale. Uh, so we, it's not a, it's not okay. We're not committed to being short term. We are short term and we're going more short term just because of uh, the market opportunity effectively. So if you look at the uh, trading system, uh, at, at the time frames, like how long you're holding a trade on average, uh, if you trade a very long term, markets are very negatively skewed today. It means they typically climb slowly and reverse very fast, which has been a problem for long term trend followers. So long term trend follower indices, which used to be positively skewed today, are no longer positive skewed. They're not able to provide the uh, hedging for equities. Effectively, long-term trend followers have missed uh, the three or four of the last uh, equity corrections. We saw that long-term trading is no longer positively skewed. Very short-term trading is more, uh, because of transaction cost sensitivity, is also uh, typically needs to be more mean reverting in nature and more market-making type. Uh, we saw that seven to 10 days is a time frame where you're getting uh, the most positive skew and you're also less exposed to transaction costs. Uh, than the shorter term time frame, so we stuck to that time frame. Uh, that's that's why we're kind of like short term. It's more uh, because of uh, the availability of skew and low transaction costs at that time frame. But inside of that is kind of some so a little bit of classic type trend following. Uh, some of this volatility breakout type models. Uh, what else is included in there without giving away all the secret sauce? Yeah. Uh, I wish I had secrets, but. Uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so over the years, we started with basically literally the model I told you. Look at the average true range of the last two days and then add a multiple of uh, that number to the open to go long on a stop and, and uh, deduct a multiple of that from the open to go short and exit two days later. Okay. Literally. We traded the same thing. We called it eye swing back in the day. It was, it was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So the way... Uh, things that evolved for us is, you know, people in general today, especially with the, the advent of machine learning, and you have thousands of quants graduating every year from uh, all the different grad schools and all that. Uh, you can teach uh, trend following to, we teach trend following to high school interns at Quest. It's like kind of like their first week project, right? And you can replicate the CTA indices with literally uh, those simplistic models. So what can we do to generate alpha? You look at the short-term space in particular, uh, all these guys are trying to create alpha in, in 20 years since we've been around, I would say probably one out of 20 or one out of 30 firms is still alive. So yeah. very, very uh, risky uh, business model. What Especially can we do? in the short term index is even higher. Correct. Than Correct. So what the, the way we evolve where most people are getting uh, more rigid in terms of optimizing. So they're looking for models that are more complex, trying to go deeper into the understanding of how markets function with the belief that market stability, if you, on, if, you, uh, if you go deep enough that you're going to understand market structure and uh, that's going to provide you with stable alpha, okay? Like if I have this smart quant, he's going to come, he's going to give me a model with a sharp ratio of two. 
uh, and uh, that sharp ratio is going to continue. Now, the reality is 99 times out of 100, that sharp ratio of two ends up being or flat or negative when you start trading. And it's not a question of over-optimization or that the models are too complex and uh, they've, made a, they've misjudged the level of optimization and it's just spurious returns that they had in simulation. Not at all. It's more a question. You can do the same thing on uh, quite simplistic models that are not over-optimized. Uh, what we do is we're assuming, and it seems that matches reality, that the moment a factor has worked, due to the you know, advent of uh, quant trading and machine learning and all that, uh, there's a lot of capital which basically follows the idea or the factor, and very quickly the factor becomes overpriced or crowded uh, and stops working. So it's not, if quants hadn't chased the factor, it would have continued working, but the fact that money came into the factor, it stopped working. So uh, try saying, to- Sorry, just even, even if it's not published in a paper or whatnot, you're saying there's so many quants, they're gonna arrive at the same conclusion almost simultaneously and put that- money Correct, in. correct. There's so much intelligence in the market and optimization and computing power looking for what has worked, whether you understand what has worked or not, in particular today where most of the alpha, numerical alpha, I'm not saying skill-based alpha, but the, the numerical alpha which is produced in the market is due to tail risk. Even if things look uncorrelated, the moment the market goes down, the volatility increases against you, the losses go, get, uh, you know, uh, basically you lose money faster and faster, the correlation increases, and you get exactly the opposite effect of, than what you thought. Okay. <laughs> So I was just going to say, you reminded me of a paper by Ben Hunt. I don't know if you ever read his stuff, but uh, was saying the market, you know, everyone's thinking it's a clockwork machine. And if I could just figure out the gears a little bit better, I could beat it. And he's saying, no, it's a bonfire and you can't really model it. Um, so you can try. But this is kind of those two thoughts at the same time. One, it's not a clockwork machine, but people are still developing models as if it were. And that's crowding out those models. Uh, human behavior, if humans like confidence, they were always taught since they were kids to believe their own ideas. And the more, you, uh, the more evidence you gave them to believe something, such as a very powerful backtest, uh, the more confidence they were and the, the, the more money they would allocate to the idea. I'd, I haven't seen many investors who don't follow uh, that process before investing. So show me your simulation. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is very, very predictable. That's my old saying. Nobody ever lost money on a spreadsheet. Well, the thing is, markets are much less liquid than most people uh, think. Or uh, it's much less liquid than most investment managers tell their investors. So yeah. effectively, if somebody tells you, you know, our capacity is a billion dollars, assume it's going to be three or four hundred million. Most people underestimate uh, the market impact that they have, not only from a transaction cost perspective, but from the perspective of impacting the long-term behavior of markets, right? Uh, and that's really, we're talking, you know, very meaningful stuff here because why, why do thousands of quants who design even simple models eventually cannot produce true alpha in the markets? What is it that happens between the simulation and real life? And most quants don't ask themselves that question. They're very confident of their ideas, but then the, once the returns are not there, they just keep coming with new ideas, thinking the next one is going to work, not understanding that there's something extremely wrong in the thinking itself and the process of optimization. Not over-optimization, just plain optimization. Historical return analysis distorts markets in a very predictable way. The, um, which, right, which is just a fancy way of saying past performance not necessarily indicative of future returns, right? Like it's, you can model it, you're feeling good about it, but it's not gonna, history's not gonna look the same moving forward. Well, it's likely to look the opposite of what it was if too many people believe in it. Definitely. And yeah. let's go back to the skew for a minute. So, and this was an interesting thought. So you're after positive yeah. skew, you're after convexity in the model, but you're not using options, correct? Correct. Uh, so, most people think of convexity by buying an option for 10 cents and selling it for $10 or something, right? It geometrically increases. So if you're just doing futures and Delta one, how do you get that convexity? How do you think about that? Well, uh, most markets have embedded optionality in them. So suppose you're short net gas, 
uh, in the winter months and long net gas in the summer months as a spread with a looks like Delta one. The reality is the risk on the in the winter months is multiples of uh, the risk in the summer months. The volatility of the two is typically the same, but if you have a real shortage of uh, net gas in the winter, you're going to have a massive distortion in that spread. So what ends up happening is the winter months uh, uh, trade uh, more expensive than the summer months. And then there's a possibility of uh, net gas going from two to five, where you're not going to go from two to minus five. So uh, effectively, all markets, uh, equities is the same. Uh, equity indices, as the market goes down, the leverage, uh, the cor you know, corporate leverage, uh, investor leverage, portfolio deleveraging, uh, all those things kind of accentuate the moves and you have much higher volatility on the downside in equities today than you did on the upside, right? In a, in a bear market, you have the opposite. You have upside increases in volatility and a very slow down moves. But today we're, so effectively convexity exists in all markets due to uh, the internal leverage of the position itself, such as, you know, the, the, the uh, equity to debt ratio in a company, but also due to the volatility assumptions that most investors make. If you trade risk parity and your position sizing is inversely proportional to three-year volatility, volatility increases when the market is going down, you have to sell, which accentuates the volatility and it's a very self-reinforcing thing. So today, uh, the, uh, the Buffett ratio, uh, the size of uh, the market cap of equities uh, to the GDP is about 1.5. It's the highest ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and effectively, that means that every time uh, the stock market goes down 1%, it has about a 1.5% uh, effect on GDP, yeah. right? So effectively, the tail has gotten heavier than the dog. And the thing that depends on the dog is actually literally wagging the dog. Yeah. So convexity is uh, highly correlated to this type of leverage. So if you want to predict skew in the market, uh, the Buffett ratio is a very, very good predictor of skew. And But as I think of it, if I'm graphing, right, if I'm, I have my trading model, I go short the S&P, whatever, on a breakout. But if I graph that, right, the profits I can make is just the uh, straight line up, right? It's not a convex. It doesn't have that curve to it. But you're saying the ability to get from here to here on the line is because the market itself is sh going to show this convexity. Correct. The market uh, volatility is not stable. It expands in a predictable way. So is correlation. Correlation is not stable. It increases in a predictable way based on skew. So if you look at two markets that have zero cor correlation and producing alpha to the S&P, they're highly likely to be negatively skewed, which means when the S&P goes down, their correlation to the S&P is going to increase. Their correlation to each other is going to increase their volatility is going to increase and you're going to have to deliver while all that is happening. Yeah. Okay. Crazy. This is very, very predictable. So you don't need to well, have... Well, March 2020 was the, right, is the case study. That's one of them. Yep. Yeah. The, one of. There's been many. I mean, that was a, a multi-week event, but yeah. you have those events uh, intraday. So you say, well, there hasn't been a real correction. I don't know what's negatively skewed and what's not. And how do you measure skew? If you look at uh, the market short term enough, you will see that uh, the way the volatility of markets changes is highly predictive of what's gonna happen when there's a real crisis. So something can look very, very stable, very beautiful, tons of alpha, whether it's a, an asset or a hedge fund strategy or trading strategy, and it can, but you can predict the lack of stability even in stable times based on uh, looking at skew. Uh, I'm gonna say that the alpha of the hedge fund industry is completely explained by tail risk. It means you can replicate the hedge fund industry without any skill if you take skew into account. Yeah, I was going to go there next and ask you, right? We talked a little bit about this of, uh, right, hand in hand with all this is the rest of the world is kind of focused on positive, sharp, consistent returns, you know, <laughs> what we would call negative skew. So you're saying that's not necessarily these hedge funds aren't dumb. They don't not get it. They're just giving the people what they want or are they, or are they blind? Yeah, I, uh, again, uh, if you believe what everybody else believes, you're typically going to end up in crowded uh, positions and situations. Today, uh, there was a lot of evidence that sharp ratio is a great measure of risk adjusted returns. And people are chasing sharp ratio 
sharp ratio doesn't measure tail risk. It effectively encourages you to invest in funds that have a lot of negative sharp, uh, negative tail risk. And effectively, sharp ratio is a great predictor of very large drawdowns. <laughs> yeah. So things that have high, high sharp ratio are very likely to reverse with very with drawdowns which are very large multiples of volatility. So we're saying uh, something that has positive skew will have drawdowns which are one, one and a half, or two times their vol. Uh, assets or strategies that have large sharp ratios will have drawdowns which are four times, five times, six times their volatility. Okay, so sharp ratio is a great predictor of large tail risk. Uh, alpha, which is correlated to sharp ratio, is highly, they're all 80, 70, 80, 90% correlated to tail risk. So effectively, what investors perceive as skill or what they pursue in the form of high alpha, high information, high sharp is purely, uh, literally a byproduct of tail risk. And is it fair to think of that of like they're borrowing risk from tomorrow, right? Or they're, they're pushing risk from today into tomorrow. And so you're not just, you're just not seeing it yet in the track record. Correct. Uh, now, in most cases, if you, asset management is more, institutional than it used to be. So typically somebody else is managing your money and therefore there is a misalignment of interest on the downside where uh, the asset manager makes uh, participates in the upside but doesn't participate in the downside. Yeah. So uh, these type of markets encourage a lot of uh, exposure to tail risk where uh, effectively the asset managers are not participating in the downside. So it encourages you know, the selling of convexity, the selling of gamma at any cost. It doesn't matter whether I'm uh, selling insurance, uh, you know, below uh, actuarial value because the risk is only going to show up once every 10 years. And by then I would have had made tons of money on my business. Right. right. So it's uh, now that's the wrong business. Yeah. Uh, I did, but uh, so far, so far, so good. Yeah, exactly. But Despite the discipline uh, that we've imposed on, our, imposed on ourselves. And part of me though thinks like maybe they're the, cleverer by half right maybe they figured it out of like and they would maybe argue like yes we're doing that but we have this huge fed put there's this huge the financial industrial complex we talked about that's going to swoop in and keep buying so how do you square all that of like maybe they're right because yeah they're negative skew but the downside isn't all that really isn't all that dangerous they, ha they have been right yeah so right. there's I no question about that, that. Uh, it doesn't mean that investors I mean, it's basically easier to make money being short, uh, short convexity, but investors don't have to go along with that. If they have investors can make the same alpha being long convexity, they should choose that. In fact, investors uh, should basically use convexity as part of their uh, risk analysis. Uh, if you tell me I can give you a low quality product and you're buying it, I'm say, okay, good enough. If investors uh, have higher standards uh, and look at risk correctly, they're going to see that uh, they can do things in a much more transparent way with cheaper fees and with less risk. And I remembered what I was going to ask before when we were talking about the ability to do it with positive skew. How do you, back to the model, how do you accomplish that when, right, coming off of March 2020 or similar when volatility is so high? Right. We talked about the best time to do those breakouts is kind of when vol's low. So if all those correlations are up, all that vol is up, you know, you've realized the positive skew. How do you keep that positioning on without getting, you know, huge bleed out of it? Yeah. So uh, in the concept of crowding, we're evaluating within one sector, which markets have overreacted from a volatility perspective. Uh, where are they on their, on their gamma curve? And then which sector relative to other sectors is most overpriced from a gamma perspective? Uh, and also which trend following model is overpriced uh, relative to uh, other trend following models or which time frame is overpriced relative to another. So effectively, we have uh, many dimensions uh, where we can expose ourselves to trend following uh, in one sector, in two sectors, three sectors, in one time frame, using a certain type of uh, trading methodology or in specific markets within a certain sector. And all those things are, you know, uh, uh, allow you to be more exposed uh, on the upside and less exposed on the downside, where we ended up achieving, you know, more alpha than funds which are short convexity with positive convexity. But, you, so, but there's no way to, to cheat, the, right? If all those models move up, 
the you know and they all have a high they're at the peaks of their gamma like you're going to be more lead by definition right like you either have to move to the sidelines or trade the least expensive of them but it's still expensive uh, it is more expensive once the you know there's been a 5x uh, multiplication in the vault it, it doesn't mean that you should uh, no longer be exposed Again, uh, we're going to go into, a, I guess it sounds like we're going to go into a bigger picture of what central banks have provided. Well, let's hold off on that. But yeah, um, yeah, I was just <laughs> on the model side of, of how do you view that? But you're saying like, no, I'm, we're not trying to time our insurance or time our skew or anything. Like it's, it's essentially always on, but dynamically shifted to keep the, the drag or the bleed as low as possible. Uh, you have to have bleed to be long convexity, yeah. except you have to do it in the cheapest way possible. And if you have, if you're evaluating, effectively, you can replicate CTA indices with, purely with moving averages, with 90% correlation. Now, there are ways, how, how is one trend cheaper than another? I'm saying the volatility expansion that's happened is a very good way of predicting how expensive a trend has become relative to other trends. And do you okay. look at that all as kind of an option pricing model or no? No, we don't look at the implied vols whatsoever. We're looking at realized vol only. Got it. Uh, most uh, liquidity needs of investors are correlated to realized volatility, not implied volatility in markets. And then I wanted to come back on the all these other investors and allocators and hedge funds trying to deliver this high sharp. So some would even do things, would you say, to improve their sharp? Like if, if, if you weren't you and you were some more nefarious or trying to build a great sharp model, what would you do kind of end a month or inside of different months? You could, you could goose the sharp a little, right? Listen, it's very easy to improve sharp ratio by selling out of the money optionality, right? So one way is to buy the dips, effectively to have a, a negative gamma profile. So the more negative gamma you are, so there's a kink in your beta curve. You, you're more correlated to, uh, to the S&P on the way down than on the way up. The bigger that kink in your beta curve, the more the gamma, the higher your alpha. So you can improve your alpha or your sharp by having uh, buying the dips uh, you know, faster uh, and selling the rallies faster effectively. Uh, another way of doing this is if you're trading uh, illiquid instruments is to do window dressing. Uh, which is quite easy in stock. So if I give you a, an equity uh, a book, which is leveraged uh, three times, uh, you can month end uh, move the stock price, you know, half a percent up or half a percent down, depending on your portfolio needs. So if you're down, you want to push up the uh, positions uh, slightly, price them up. And if you're up more than you need, you can basically sell them uh, in order to keep returns for next month. So by smoothing returns, that way, a month end or quarter end, depending on your, uh, uh, your pricing cycle, you're able to take returns which are correlated to the market, which are replicable, which, are, uh, which should be you know, replicated with low fees and make them look like skill-based returns. So now your returns, they're very, very correlated to the market, but in the time frame where you're priced, they're not correlated, but in reality, they're highly, they're highly correlated. Now, yeah. tailors will tell you how much of that you're doing. Just because of the window dressing. And, and then... And there's people actually doing that, as far as you know, or who, who knows? That's how you would do it. Wait, wait, wait. Of course. I mean, it's not yeah. a, uh, by the way, some of these things are called uh, portfolio rebalancing. They're not called yeah, yeah. the window dressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then how do you, how do you, so if I'm an investor, I'm putting together a portfolio of hedge funds or whatever, and they all have great sharps. I don't see any negative skew. Like, how do I go about I, know, I have a little inkling there's negative skew there, but how do I go about kind of assessing that, what that price is? What, how can I assess that risk? It's a complex analysis, but uh, look at uh, things which are correlated to your hedge fund, which are going to, if you don't know what your hedge fund is doing, look for uh, replicators. And the replicators will typically have higher transparency and higher liquidity will tell you what's happening in months, which you cannot perceive in the NAV of your hedge fund. Right. Right. Uh, in most cases, a short VIX is a good benchmark uh, to model the negative skew of most, of most hedge funds. 
right? So uh, you can use a VEX feature or, or, or that type of thing. Uh, that, that, that's one way. But remember, right. alpha and tail risk are about 80% correlated. So uh, the tail risk is there. The question is, are you measuring it uh, in the right time frame? Right, and I just think of some managers I know of who've been selling like weekly options for since the 09 bottom. And there hasn't really been a 10% weekly move. Even March 2020 was sort of contained, um, right? So they, they have a huge sharp. It's like a four or five sharp. You know, yeah. like under the hood, they're selling options. There's negative skew, but it's never shown up yet in 12 plus years. So it's like, how do I assign that negative skew value to that? And like you said, I could, what's it look like? How's it correlated to the short VIX in every day or something like that? Yeah, there's different dimensions to this problem. And yeah. I would say the option guys who, who are doing it uh, in a less visible way, uh, typically on the right at the money, uh, weekly options and go long, long term out of the money options. Yeah. Effectively, they tell you we're long volatility and long skew and we're getting positive alpha and positive carry. <clears throat> now, the risk is if you have a short term uh, reversals which uh, sustain themselves for a long time, then you will actually see the tail. Yeah, if you get middled, I would call it, right? <clears throat> okay, yeah. it didn't yeah. explode and pay out on your calls, but it didn't drop, so it's right there in the middle and you're... Yep, yep, yep. Um, so um, there are ways to hide some of the principal risks of that trade, effectively, what I'm saying. But most hedge funds, the hedge fund industry overall, doesn't. Uh, and then moving on, we talked a little bit about this. I had it as a separate... Uh, topic here, but we can touch on it again real quick. Uh, and one of the things I've always appreciated about you and Quest is you're playing the players, not necessarily the game itself. I feel like a lot of people are modeling just the markets. They think that's the way to go. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you think about that. And is it literally like, I know that there's going to be 10,000 contracts when this breaks this moving average. So I'm going to stay away from that. Or is it a more philosophical uh, approach? Well, uh, there's the belief that markets are made up of human behavior and human behavior is much more predictable than markets. Uh, human behavior, uh, asset allocation is driven by confidence. It's driven by investment committees. It's driven by evidence. It's driven by sharp ratio. And those things are things that you can actually measure systematically. <clears throat> so uh, effectively, uh, based on the... Uh, the character of the equity curves of certain strategies or markets, we can predict uh, inflow of capital, the effect of the capital inflow on transaction costs, and on the overall behavior of the markets. And it's so, an easy example of like the growth of risk parity and how big that's gotten. Uh, so risk parity uh, based on the current realized volatility and correlation of equities and fixed income, you can predict how large uh, risk parity uh, uh, positions are in equities and fixed income. And you also can predict what the rolling realized volatility is going to be once the market starts to drop. You can predict the liquidity needs of such strategies once, they, uh, uh, once the market starts to go down. And you can predict the impact on how risk parity is reinforcing an, a bull market in equities and fixed income when the vol is compressing and they're constantly adding to their positions as well. And but that in that example, will that allow you to hold on to a long position a little bit longer or how does it feed back to the model? Well, if you want negative skew, uh, there is a part of. Uh, yeah, which none of us do on this pod. We want positive skew here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you have to understand both sides of the equation. So uh, let's say you take a Robin Hood or something. Uh, there's, like a, there's ways to manipulate a stock by bringing in retail slowly over time because as you create a momentum idea and you create media and you create a frenzy around the stock, you can create a thing that will attract a lot of retail inter interest in something which will create a bubble which is <clears throat> quite substantial and meaningful. So uh, whether you have an investment club or you write a newsletter or you're part of... Uh, business Daily. Yeah. Whatever it is, so there's a way, there's an aspect of stock manipulation which is always happening, which has the ability to create alpha because the alpha and the way you trade is more directly related to the market and people who are responding to you don't exactly know your signals 
and you typically exit at the top and basically leave other people hanging. So there's a momentum trading, right? Sector rotation, you want to call it, or a yeah. factor rotation, blah, blah, you know, like uh, all that. <clears throat> a lot of that is, you know, you have firms like AQR managing tens of billions uh, in, uh, in factor, you know, factor. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge strategy, which effectively you're chasing returns at high leverage with very high transaction costs, right? In, in um, market neutral positions. <clears throat> so if you understand that, uh, the impact of that is very, very, very meaningful. And you know, our job is to predict it. Yeah. And uh, right. It's the old line. If you don't know who the sucker at the <clears throat> table is, it's, it's probably you, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, you have to, uh, uh, there are many aspects to skew. Crowding is very important. The confidence is very important. These are all things that are like predictable and measurable. And wh what are you? What are your thoughts on as there's more and more AI models and kind of total <clears throat> black box and they don't really know how the returns are generated, will that result in less predictability? It results in more uh, monothematic thinking, right? So more exposure to certain factors, which the final investor is not aware of. <clears throat> it results in less transparency effectively. So right. an investor thinks he's investing in AI he doesn't think he's investing in risk parity. <laughs> but, <laughs> and risk parity uh, thinks that they're investing in risk parity. They don't realize they're investing in the Fed. <laughs> all right. And my okay. thing, like, even all these AIs, won't they, you know, if you <clears throat> eventually have the same computing power and everything, won't they all come up with the same? I mean, I know there's a million different inputs and the human bias is built into it. But in theory, if they're all equally powerful AI, they're going to come up with a similar result, right? Yep, yep. Uh, like in 2017, uh, the Sharpe ratio on a short VIX, I think, went to 15 on 12 months rolling basis, Sharpe ratio of 15. <clears throat> uh, and a lot of uh, quants effectively started bottom picking the stock market, the VIX, blah, blah, in, in multiple different ways. But effectively, all those strategies uh, correlated. And in Feb, uh, I think it was Feb, 20, uh, Feb 18, mm -hmm. you had that uh, vol crash. VIX, uh, Correct. So, uh, Effectively, you're creating opaqueness. You're justifying taking correlated positions uh, and creating a cloud around it so it doesn't look like you're doing something which is simple and replicable. So AI is great because it can help you automate decisions, but you cannot give it the ultimate uh, power to have common sense and understand crowding. AI is purely replicating the past, and it's highly likely to lead you into crowded positions. So. Uh, over the years, the complexity of modeling of markets has increased substantially, but the complexity has not improved the risk adjusted returns of investors. Right. So uh, it's where you stand relative to markets and today the fact that AI is free, pretty much, uh, means that's the benchmark technologically. It's not going to give you an edge in itself. It depends on how you apply it. You have to apply it in a way which is differentiated from the rest of the market in order for you to provide liquidity when the market needs it and take liquidity when the market is providing it to you too cheaply. Um, do you guys use any machine learning or anything to crunch the data? A little. Yeah. <clears throat> we don't have uh, live learning, but we use the learning in the simulation process and the design process. So uh, there's certain aspect of our thinking in the research process, which is easily replicable. Uh, and AI is a, you know, quite useful there, but we don't use it uh, uh, at a high level to decide what we're actually going to trade. We're using it to think in a very limited way uh, in a narrow buckets of thinking, which are not related to market crowding. Yeah, it reminds me of there was a big article on man, AHL's AI, and the example they used was it bought the dip when Trump got elected, elected in the market dropped and they bought the dip, which is just speaking to what you're saying, it ran the past history and it said buy all the dips sure. and it, worked, it worked that time doesn't mean it's a long-term risk adjusted positive trade correct um, um, ai is not well suited to pick positively skewed trades and couldn't you couldn't you make that one of the inputs though only give me positively skewed trades it's not going to happen naturally yeah <laughs> right or it would give you that weekly right it would give you this was positively skewed doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be possibly skewed. You need to rely on very uh, fine tuning to use AI to pick positively skewed trades. 
Uh, and how do you, which circling back to the model, how do you identify which are the positively skewed trades? It's just that it's not risking more than it's looking to make, or is it more nuanced than that? Uh, actually, in the in the in the case of system design, uh, skew of daily returns, skew of monthly returns is quite simple uh, statistic to tell you whether the model is positive skewed or not. Yeah, <clears throat> and then you can look at the the degree of uh, risk on risk off exposure and that type of thing. So for for models, it's quite easy to see whether something is positive skewed or not. But to me, I'm like, if I'm just doing a simple <clears throat> trade, if I risk ten grand to make one thousand dollars, to me that's a negatively skewed trade over time. But in theory, if I ran it at the right times and it's back test, it might show as positively skewed in the data. So you have a, some methodology of saying matching it with reality, basically, of what the true risk is. Um, the way we trade, which is, I mean, we, we don't over optimize. So the, we limit the number of factors that our models have. Uh, so therefore, the optim over optimization risk is minimal. Typically, we're, if we have a model that makes money and doesn't make money when you start trading, it's typically the byproduct of market impact. Yeah. And so we don't have that issue. So typically, positively skewed models are not going to easily get crowded because no, nobody's looking for those. Models which are negatively skewed are typically the ones that attract capital and they get over-influenced. Right. And a good way to think of that might be like, trend following silver we did an example a couple months ago it had lost on a simple breakout it lost like 18 times in a row right but lost a small amount and then the 19th time is a huge outlier move right that's that's a positive skew but you're likely no one's going to choose that to put in their portfolio correct they have this maniacal you know devotion to the positive skew right well, most investors, the most certain thing you have is that most investors chase returns and chase sharp. So you want to do what you're doing with minimal exposure to historical returns and historical sharp from that perspective. I want to move on, talk a little bit about your, uh, you guys do a monthly report called the quest book which is quite cool as um right first part of it is like your returns and alpha and all that jazz but then the second half is more informative to me but just economic indicators the buffett ratio versus this everything you were talking about liquidity measures you know i don't know how many pages it's up to now like 50 or 60 or something but tons of information in there. So I'd encourage any that anyone can just go where to your website and sign up and get it. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to get it. There's a lot of great information in there, but talk a little bit, um, or I'll just start with one thing I really noticed in there was the hedge fund replication, which we've touched on here, but like, how, how are you guys doing that? It's almost spot on to the hedge fund index, uh, which is amazing, right? There's guys managing billions of dollars and earning billions in fees and you can replicate it rather easily. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quite a simplistic model, which effectively replicates the hedge the fund industry using S&Ps, uh, MSCI index, and short VIX, <clears throat> right? So now, if you want even more accuracy than that basic model, you take that model and instead of using the S&P, you use the S&P with legs, which means uh, the returns of the hedge fund index this month is also dependent on the returns of the S&P last month and the months before, because some hedge funds report quarterly, <clears throat> so to begin with. Uh, and also, uh, there's the window dressing component, right? So yeah, if I have a little yeah, leeway yeah. on my illiquid positions to move the, the stock or uh, the, the, the fixed income position month end, I can smooth out my returns. But overall, over the next two, three months, that's going to kind of like average out. Wash out, yeah. So you can actually, uh, when you take that smoothing into account, then you get into even more accurate uh, replication of the hedge fund index. And that again, tie, so it's cool just to look at, but it, it, you're using it, it's tying into your models and where that crowding might be as well. Well, uh, we're not using that model specifically, but the reason we, uh, we have the Quest book is to, uh, we want investors to be as educated as possible when they come to us. They want us to, I want them to understand the CTA index, how to replicate it, what components of the index uh, replication are doing well, not well, 
in order for me to be able to speak to them in a very detailed way in terms of how, to, how we differentiate ourselves from the typical CTA. Right, and we didn't even get into that, so I'll mention that real quick. As well as the hedge fund indicator, you have the CTA replication, uh, and then you also have a product that people can invest in, right? That's the CTA replicator, uh, low fee yeah. product. So, so my goal is transparency and look through for CTAs and for the hedge fund industry, so that investors come in not uh, thinking that there's like this magic thing out there which is producing alpha, which is skill based. It really that 99% of hedge fund returns can easily be replicated with simplistic strategies. Right, and, uh, and the takeaway for me from the CTA replication is most all that return comes from fixed income, and a lot of it can be explained lately by long bias, longer term. Um, so you're saying, and I give you guys credit if you're sticking your stripes and saying, hey, we're not. Uh, falling for that siren song, we're going to stick to our, our knitting, so to speak. Uh, so explain kind of what you guys have seen inside of that CTA index of what those performance drivers are. Yeah. So if you replicate the CTA index first, they're using three different moving average crossover. Uh, let's say five day to 100, uh, five day to 300 even uh, are good enough. <clears throat> and you can have, uh, we ran an actual replicator, which has uh, like 90% or 85% correlation to the CTA index with about 2% of alpha which is due to the fact that our, uh, the fees of the replicator are cheaper than the index. Yeah. So uh, now uh, what you see there, that's like the, and our replicator is more positively skewed than the CTA index. Effectively, <laughs> CTAs over the years have, uh, in order to improve their sharp ratio, uh, drifted into more and more risk on strategies. So they've added effects carry, they've added credit strategies, they've added bottom picking equities, uh, uh, they've added more exposure to fixed income and they've introduced long bias. So if, if you look at the returns of CTAs or the basic trend following strategies that replicate the index, most of the returns in the last 20 years come from fixed income. Effectively, fixed income and the return on cash explain 100% of the returns of the CTA indices. Uh, second, so, if, Real quick on that, that's not just the big uptrend in prices, downtrend in rates, but you're saying the right, earning the T-bill interest, essentially. Correct. If yeah. you take the, for a CTA, a T-bill rate is very important for CTA. So if you take the T-bill rate out of the CTA indices, uh, to, uh, where you are today is very close to where you were in 2003, in September 2003, about 20 years ago. Yeah. Effectively, CTAs have pretty much made just the risk-free rate in uh, about 20 years, 18 years. <clears throat> so first, it's a mainly fixed income. And it doesn't mean that CTAs cannot make money in commodities and other things. Just net yeah. net uh, risk rate plus uh, uh, return on long-term fixed income is 100% of the return. Second is uh, close to 100% of returns comes from the long trades. We're living in an inflationary world. So although measured inflation is like 2% or whatever it is, if you bought, by, if you ran a model by mistake, <laughs> which uh, bought every future contract and never sold it, uh, you would have had the returns which are better than the CTA index. <laughs> so uh, uh, the average more volatility probably, but yeah. Uh, sometimes so with more of a, uh, overall, I'd say a better sharp ratio than the CTA index. Yeah. Net net, the CTA portfolio, the assets that CTA trade, the 80 markets, 100 markets, whatever, uh, are appreciating at about 6% a year. Except for so, grains. Yeah, but today there. So yeah, coming back to the book and we're starting to touch on this and you're saying risk parity is a bet on the Fed, all this stuff. So what are some of the biggest economic factors you're looking at that are in the book or outside of the book? Um, you know, what the rest of this year looks like and into next year and into the next decade, I guess. I mean, the, the big one in terms of uh, the way we relate to the outside world and how we model outside reality is by modeling table risk and how expensive is tail risk. We're not actually trying to predict uh, the macroeconomic environment, et cetera. But what tail risk, uh, if you look at the SKU index dates at uh, all time highs, effectively, uh, we're saying that the, the outside world is the riskiest it's ever been and investors are prone to larger surprises than ever before, okay? So that's my view of the outside world. Uh, Effectively, I mean, and we know this, central banks, I mean, last year uh, we printed about uh, 4 trillion uh, worth of dollars just because of COVID outside of the normal budget deficit. Yeah. And this year, uh, you know, we're talking about another, another 6 trillion. 
right? So, uh, a lot of bridges. Uh, it's a lot of bridges you have to build and a lot of free money for uh, waiters and all that. So, yeah. So, um, in, in New York, I have friends who run, uh, you know, let's say restaurants or other businesses. Uh, somebody who's making $80,000 a year is better served being on unemployment than working. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, the caretakers... PPP setup was incented restaurant owners to like pay their people for three months, shut down, then they could keep 70% of the money and right. then open later, right? Open Correct. Later. Anyway. Um, so, so the instability of the uh, macroeconomic reality is higher than ever. But where, right, MMT folks would say, no, it doesn't matter. It's just adding digital zeros and it's not really going to be inflation. Deficits don't matter anymore. Where, where do you stand on all that? Well, not where I stand, but uh, yeah. if you look at the last 100 years, they're 100% correct. But if you read the history book, they're 100% wrong. <laughs> yeah. So the history I, I'm, I'm all they for Warren, Bu Warren Buffett and all these people that say gold is an ancient relic. Except gold is the currency which is stronger than the U.S. dollar. It's the longest-term currency that's been around. Uh, it's more solid than any paper currency. It cannot be printed. And, uh, you know, there's an incentive for central banks to discourage people from investing in gold because when you invest in gold, they cannot print gold and take money away from you like they do today with the dollar. Yeah. And I guess, would you say in some of the charts, right, does it even matter if it's right or wrong? Like if it if it makes the whole system perhaps less stable, if it adds volatility, that's just what you're after, right? Um, I mean, uh, we're in an unstable equilibrium. We look more stable than ever. If you look at the returns of the stock market, et cetera, but we're less stable than ever when you really look at the factors which are, haven't basically manifested in the market yet. Right, that's so our it's purpose. It's kind of the same as these guys gaming their sharp ratio, right? Like you're gaming the economy, gaming the borrowing, um, borrowing risks from today and pushing it out to tomorrow. Correct. Uh, by, by creating inflation, by printing money, distributing money, uh, asset price inflation gives the perception of wealth uh, and people go and spend and basically it moves the economy. The reality is they're, uh, that uh, first they're gonna get taxed very, very substantially on their capital gains. And second, the gain is in real terms is not actually there. It's actually negative. So the fact that you made 20% a year in the last three years in the stock market, when you really look at it on an, on an inflation adjusted basis, it's not that much, especially after capital gain tax. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you don't really care whether you're right or wrong, right? If it's just, it's systematic and hey, if I'm completely wrong and MMT is real and we're in this Goldilocks forever, whatever, there's going to be some market moves that happen and we're positioned to capture them. Correct. So yeah. our thinking in terms of the outside world is modeled quite simplistically through convexity, right? So I can spend my days on a higher economist and higher, higher Greece and all that, but we don't have to. I think our model of the external reality, uh, we're assuming uh, instability. It's better than assuming stability. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. A lot has to go right for more stability, right? Correct. Correct. Um, and so what does that look like in terms of liquidity and volume and volatility uh, in your mind? Uh, liquidity today is uh, much less reliable than it used to be. Effectively, liquidity is provided by market making hedge funds, such as the citadels of the world that can effectively switch off their market making operations for a day or you know, after a couple of hours of losses, literally. Yeah. Where before that liquidity was provided by banks that had longer term perspectives and clients to maintain, et cetera. So uh, liquidity, I'm going to say in markets is much less than people assume. Uh, it's highly unreliable and it typically dries out exactly when you need it. Right. And so that's, it's, there, it's there on a normal day. It might be totally gone on an abnormal day. When you need it, it's not going to be there. Yeah. And so then it's you a, want to be the liquidity provider at that point, right? Uh, you know, I would say some people should be, but uh, not our job to do that. But uh, yeah. there is a, there is room to be a market maker when uh, the, the large ones uh, have basically pulled off. But remember that because volatility is so suppressed compared to the volatility of the economic reality out there, the vol can expand by multiples. 
and the bid ask spread can ex can expand by multiples and still not be expensive enough for you to justify uh, to justify market making. Yeah, I saw that. So, I was playing around looking at the GameStop options when that whole thing was going on, and it was like the stock had to move like two hundred eighty dollars in a week in order for you to make money on the on the option. The premium was so high, so that was the embodiment of that, right? The market maker was saying, "You can buy this thing, but I'm gonna I'm gonna price it out of this world." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, market making has been uh, idealized. Uh, I'm going to say it's almost like an idol today. Like everybody thinks that it's like free money. It's yeah. no longer the case. Yeah. And, but to me, that's always a weird thing. Like they can turn it off these days. Like the banks could always turn it off also. Or are we saying they had like alternative no. motives or different, different? Well, motives? if a bank turned off the market making uh, desk, you as a client would, would move your capital elsewhere. Yeah, so yeah. they had a longer term perspective on things. Well, it also people. might be why, right? The, their inability to turn it off might be why they're sort of out of the game too. Um, Correct. But they got regulated out as well. Yeah. So that was liquidity. Um, let, what else do we say? Volatility. So yeah. they go hand in hand, but so volatility outlook longer term. <laughs> Volatility can go to zero, but the risk in the market can be higher than ever. So when we started trading 20 years ago, the vol on the S&P was 20%. Today, the vol on the S&P is 10%, but the drawdowns are larger than they were at, at our time you know, 20 years ago, right? So effectively, vol is being massaged and compressed due to the short gamma exposure in markets. Effectively, people are committed to buying the dips and selling the rallies because that produces alpha. Uh, the only thing... Uh, that's not the real risk. So effectively, markets don't move in line with economic reality. So if econo the economy is going up and down and the markets are not moving, you go, wait a second, are markets uh, really representing the economy or what's going on? So today, markets are uh, unrelated to the re economic reality, yeah. right? So uh, volatility, which you measure in the markets, effectively is not really telling you the real risk. The real risk, you still have to look at the economy, go, wait a second, you know? <laughs> We're more levered than ever. We're making less money than ever. Our productivity is lower than ever. Uh, you know, uh, money velocity is like slowing down. Uh, aging population is going to want to be exposed to less risk. You know, we have a few headwinds ahead of us. Uh, but we've seen in like commodities and elsewhere, the volatility has started to pick up. Just realized vol has picked up, right? And yeah. so it might look like we're moving into a, from the CTA bucket, we might be, you know, their 80 to 100 markets might be moving up into a new vol range. Yes. Uh, so uh, the world, uh, the word inflation happens to be showing up more often than it used to, yeah. uh, despite what the central bankers tell you. And uh, some people are starting to shift away from the dollar, which can be effectively, you can be uh, taxed. <laughs> indirectly where every time they print money and are starting to buy real assets as a hedge against that risk. Right. Uh, Canadian real estate. The, uh, yeah. If, if I'm an investor, I come to you and be like, cool, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm worried about inflation. I'm going to invest with you as an inflation hedge. Do you say, well, slow down or you're like, okay, that makes sense. I mean, uh, inflation, uh, we tend to do very, very well in inflationary periods. Right, but how is that? Like we haven't really seen them. So how? Just in testing, you're saying in the well, of, like in micro bursts that you've seen. Uh, in the Bush years, uh, we had a, a small cycle of inflation going into 2007. As a good example, so uh, the, the the amount of markets that we can trade and markets which are not controlled by central banks is much larger in inflationary periods than during controlled inflation periods like we are today. So if liquidity goes into commodities and people, uh, commodities actually start to move, central banks cannot print commodities. They can subsidize those industries such as farming, which they do in order to control prices. But uh, uh, commodities uh, cannot as easily be controlled as currencies, fixed income or equities. Right. So you can't, would, the Fed can't grow more trees to help lumber prices. right? Uh, not directly, no. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, they'll subsidize. Uh, and run industries at uh, at a loss in order to not have perceived inflation. 
and where how far do you think they would go so we're talking about subsidized whomever you think we you know in this last downturn we saw them buy corporate bonds like are we far off or they're just going to outright buy apple or amazon and you know stop some big drawdown that there's, there's no reason to stop i mean they have a great business model uh <laughs> they can print money uh, you can't print i can't print money uh so whatever they need to do to maintain that business model my sense is they will continue doing um for most people it seems like there's no consequence to that again if you've read history books you know that a hundred percent of the time that game has a very very bad ending a very bad ending a hundred percent of the time and this time won't be different i don't care how different this time is. <laughs> right. Even though it could be a year, 10 years, 50 years later. That's the trick, right? Yeah. Uh, again, the, the, the thing is we can do what we do, generate returns, beat uh, position towards larger volatility. Uh, we don't have to, we're not betting on, oh, this is going to happen or not. We're betting in the general direction of vol. Yeah. So uh, why take unnecessary risks where you're going to give up 10, 20 years, 30 years of returns? Uh, if you're, you know, invested in equities, when you can uh, have the returns uh, uh, while being long vol, right? And it's not an either or, right? Like have your equity Correct. plus this and rebalance Correct. it too and enjoy enjoy life. Correct. Um, and then one last one last thing out of your book, and I'm talking with Scott in your office about this, and kind of the negative rates and kind of the under the radar issues that that can create. Um, you know, the Archibagos, I can never pronounce that, Bill Huang, supposedly was getting paid to take on more leverage. Like, have any thoughts on that? Listen, uh, when interest rates are at zero, uh, you have many, many free options available uh, and very cheap free options. So very cheap means, uh, uh, you know, you're not even paying a cost of carry on them. Leverage is, an infinite leverage is almost available, right? Bill Huang, he went, he had multiple credit lines buying the same stock uh, to the point where the company that he was buying was like, wait a second, uh, how did our stock get here? Let's, <laughs> let's yeah. issue some stock. <laughs> and he put that. So, yeah, there uh, were the SPACs, right? They were borrowing. There was a, pre, a discount built in there. So hedge funds were borrowing at zero, basically. Correct. Buying the SPACs. And if there was a deal done, they'd make 10%. If there's no deal, they get their money back. Yeah. Uh, we've been peers like this. We've always thought it's different and we've always gone back to, you know what? Reality does matter. Reality wins 100% of the time, unfortunately. Uh, but in the meantime, there are little games that are played which are encouraged uh, or they're kind of like side, uh, you know, side effects of what central banks are doing. Uh, they don't seem to mind very much. Uh, those things are more extreme than they were in 99 or in 07. Yeah. So... Uh, and they're seemingly out of bullets, although we just said they'll, they'll create, they'll build new bullets. Yeah. Well, uh, according to, if you read what the central bankers have written, they have plenty of stuff to buy. I mean, they can, I think Bernanke said that uh, he'll, he'll buy the garbage off the streets and put cash instead. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, at some stage, if you want to devalue a currency, you can really uh, take it much further than they currently have. Uh, but with the level of debt that we're at, you know, I would say it's the only course of action. Any other thoughts on the on Quest overall or the market or anything before we move on? Anything we didn't cover? Stay, stay away from the crowd. Stay away, stay from, away the from the crowd. Yeah. It feels safe, but it's very, very unsafe today. The, you should write a book, The w Non-Wisdom of Crowd. Cool. We'll do some of your favorites here. Uh, favorite investing book? Uh, Covell, uh, the trend following. Right. Yeah. yeah. He's had you on before, I think, too, right? Yes, um, yeah. Favorite New York restaurant? That's tough. Uh, I'm going to say 300,000. Uh, Cipriani, downtown. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um, favorite place to go outside of New York when you want to get out of the city? Uh, Woodstock, New York. Nice. The uh, I got a friend who has a place up there. I'll, I'll connect you guys. I went to school in upstate and Schenectady in Union College. So I know the area a little bit. Uh, your favorite quest, white paper. 
it's got to be the skew, right? Yeah, the skew one, yeah. I guess it's the most uh, used, yeah. We'll put that one in there. And then finally, yeah. your uh, favorite Star Wars character that we ask everyone. Yesterday was May the 4th. Uh, Yoda, I guess. Yoda, I like it. Yeah. The wise, the wise Yoda. Yeah. Um, great. We're living re- Many aspects of our lives are just like a dream-like, and we take them for reality until we wake up. <laughs> until we wake up or do some meditation. Yeah. Uh, and then I got to ask you before we go on the gold discs back there. Is that your gold holdings or what, what are those? Uh, so th- those are, that's an art piece, but it kind of, a, it's a, a little bit of recall of the gongs, which I use uh, for meditation. Uh, so I'm really into like sound healing and stuff. And uh, so it's kind of. Uh, so you, you, know, you hit the gong and it vibrates, then you kind of focus in on that noise. Well, it creates a sound which actually affects the way that you think. So uh, I don't know the theory, but they say that the, we think in sounds and vibration. And that, that vibration actually if, uh, shut, shuts down your everyday thoughts. And it's uh-huh. a very useful tool in uh, helping you meditate. So people who don't know how to meditate or it kind of overrides your thinking and uh, lets you uh, relax very, very deeply. You don't have it for in the office when someone comes up with a bad idea? Uh, we do have four or five of those in the office, actually. So <laughs> that's what. <one. laughs> gong show. Yeah. Uh, all right, Nagel, this has been fun. Thanks so much. Uh, Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, thanks so much. Things, yeah, hopefully things open back up and we'll see you next time I'm in New York. Thanks. Great. Talk all to right. you soon. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. The Derivative is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures and options, visit cmegroup.com. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCMAlt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.